You can find information about subscribing to the series at netrf.org slash podcast, where you'll also find helpful charts, graphs, and videos that expand on this material. If you're new to NetWise, we strongly recommend you go back and listen to the series from the beginning, starting with episode one. It will give you a solid grounding in the basics of neuroendocrine tumors and how they're treated. You can find the whole series at netrf.org slash podcast and wherever you get your podcasts. Do you have a story to tell about your own net journey? If you're a net patient who would like to participate in a future episode, please email us and let us know. Podcast at netrf.org. Welcome to NetWise. This is a podcast for neuroendocrine cancer patients and their caregivers that presents expert information and patient perspectives. My name is Jessica Thomas, Director of Patient Education at the Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation. We here at NetRF are committed to always presenting the most current, timely, and credible information about NETS and net care. And so we've started to go back and refresh older episodes of the series to make sure that they are up to date. This is a revised version of an episode that originally aired in August of 2020, where we focused on the diagnosis and treatment of NETS that have a primary tumor site in the lungs. Here's Dr. Aman Chohan, who leads the Neuroendocrine Cancer Program and co-leads the Theragnostics Program at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of Miami in Florida. Neuroendocrine cancers can originate any site of the body, and by far the three commonest sites are midgut, this is number one, pancreas, and third, most prevalent, is lung nets. So lung nets forms roughly about 15 to 20% of all neuroendocrine cancers. These are also known as thoracic or pulmonary nets. Lung nets are often less frequently discussed and reported on than those that begin in places like the pancreas or GI tract. And awareness of them remains unfortunately low, even among the doctors who specialize in lung disease. This can make it frustrating for lung net patients to find good information. I don't think there is a lot of educational material about thoracic nets as compared to carcinoid syndrome or gap nets. So I think this would be a very helpful for patients. As with all net cancers, lung nets are often tricky to properly diagnose. They do frequently present with symptoms, but there are often symptoms that can be easily mistaken for other much more common conditions like asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Here is Dr. Natalie Louis, a thoracic surgeon at Stanford Cancer Center, followed by Dr. Robert Ramirez from Ochsner Medical Center outside of New Orleans, Louisiana. This is a really common presentation for patients with central tumors because they block the airway, and it's much more common for patients to have asthma than a neuroendocrine tumor. Shortness of breath, cough, specifically sometimes patients can come in coughing up blood, um, wheezing, just this, you know, these chronic respiratory complaints, sometimes uh, pain uh, can come along with this. And here's Dr. Andrew Kaufman of Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. Some people will have a recurrent pneumonia, and this may be a totally young, healthy person that keeps getting diagnosed with an upper respiratory infection, mainly because there's a propensity for these tumors to grow within the airway and block the airways, leading to pneumonias. And rarely there's a hormonal component to it as well, so similar to some of the uh, uh, GI neuroendocrine tumors. But very often these tumors, especially the less aggressive ones, are discovered by accident when a scan is done for some other reason. You know, I've seen this plenty of times, pre-op visit for a knee replacement, and they get a chest x-ray and they say, oh, you've got a, a lung mass there. And the, the patient had no idea about it and they've been asymptomatic from it. However they're discovered, the first steps are always additional scans and a biopsy so the tumor can be properly graded by a pathologist. This is because there is a wide range of different kinds of lung nets, which have very different characteristics. They're on a continuum from very indolent cancers, like the ones that you can observe, to the very aggressive type cancers that if I see a patient in the office this afternoon, I'm putting them in the hospital tomorrow to start chemotherapy. So, you know, that's where 
our pathologists play a very important role in the diagnosis and, and telling us exactly what this is. Rather than the numbered grades we used to describe other kinds of nets, lung nets are divided into four different named categories. Typical carcinoids, atypical carcinoids, large cell neuroendocrine tumors, and small cell lung cancer. These tumors, while they're all sort of housed in the lung cancer group and housed in the neuroendocrine lung cancer group, they really have a wide spectrum of clinical behaviors and only share their microscopic characteristics and fundamental cell type of origin. They really just, in reality, behave very differently. These categories can be a little confusing to understand, so let's talk about them in more detail. Think of the four types of lung nets as four points on a line, with typical carcinoids all the way to the left, then atypical carcinoids to the left of the center, then large cell nets to the right of the center, and then finally small cell lung cancer all the way to the right end. Now picture a vertical line dividing our line in half. The two types on the left side, typical and atypical lung nets, are classified as carcinoids because they are well differentiated and their cells grow and divide more slowly. The two on the right side, large cell and small cell lung cancers, are poorly differentiated and grow and divide more quickly. Our lefties, the typical and atypical lung nets, are less aggressive, less likely to metastasize outside the lungs, and are often easier to treat. Moving to the right, large cell and small cell lung cancers are more aggressive, more likely to spread, and are more difficult to treat. Typical carcinoids often grow very slowly, sometimes developing for years without any appreciable symptoms. There are a number of treatment strategies that can be quite successful at controlling their growth, and the average 10-year survival rate for patients who have them is as high as 90%. Small cell lung cancers at the other end of the line grow very quickly, there are fewer options for treatment, and the average five-year survival rate is only around 5%, making these one of the most aggressive and deadliest cancers. So these are biologically very different diseases, and the way we manage them is very different. One commonality between all four types of lung nets is their complexity. Lung nets are best treated by a multidisciplinary team with experts in oncology, surgery, pathology, endocrinology, and radiology, all weighing in to help determine the best course of care. Let's look at some of the treatment strategies a care team might recommend for each of the four types of lung nets. In typical and atypical carcinoids, particularly the ones that haven't metastasized outside of the chest, the first and best treatment is often surgery. If patients diagnosed in early stage, a curative surgical resection can get rid of the disease in most of the patients. So there are patients who are cured. This is not possible in all lung net patients though, even all those with typical carcinoid. We generally operate for um, localized or local regional disease that can be completely resected. And that means that the tumor is confined to the lung and the thoracic lymph nodes on the same side as the tumor. Before surgery, a series of scans and tests are required to make sure the extent of the disease is properly understood. I just had a patient the other day, and it looked like this was an operable candidate with localized disease, but then when we got the gallium, this showed that that the patient had uh, distant disease. So then your treatment algorithm changes a bit. Patients obviously have to be good surgical candidates as well, so we check their functional status. Um, We check pulmonary function tests to see how healthy their lungs are and make sure that patients won't be short of breath or require oxygen after we've removed a portion of their lung. We check um, their heart, if appropriate, and we always recommend smoking cessation. Now, what type of surgery depends on the size of lung net, the location of the lung net? The idea is to preserve as much lung as possible and yet be able to take out all the tumor with negative margins. So these decisions are made in multidisciplinary tumor board. Their thoracic surgeon is available, radiologist is there, medical oncologist, pathologist, all of us are here and we discuss what would be the best approach to treat this patient. Depending on all these factors, there are several different kinds of surgery that might be performed. 
Most commonly, we do a lobectomy. So um, the lung has three lobes on the right and two lobes on the left. And generally, we like to remove the lobe that the tumor is in. So it, we take out all of the lung tissue around there, as well as all the lymph nodes that the tumor could drain into. If we remove one lobe, it's called a lobectomy, two lobes, a bilobectomy. If the tumor involves all of the lobes on one side, then we take out the entire lung on one side, and that's called a pneumonectomy. It's also really important that we take out all the lymph nodes that are accessible on the side of the chest that we're operating on, and that's called a lymph node sampling or dissection. In some cases, when the position of the tumor allows it, less invasive surgeries are sometimes possible. So for patients who have tumors that are more central and involving the airway, sometimes we do lung sparing surgery. And so we found that we can remove a piece of the airway alone and leave them with more of their lung. And so now we do what's called a sleeve resection for tumors in this area. And so we'll cut on either side and remove this sleeve of airway. And then we have to sew the two sides back together. And there are certain um, lobes where that is easier or harder or even impossible. Um, But it's really nice for patients with with, um, tumors in certain locations because they can be left with more lung, um, which leads to a better quality of life. There's also a lung sparing procedure available for some nets called a sublobar or wedge resection. But its use is somewhat controversial among surgeons. While it is less harmful to the healthy lung surrounding the tumor, some worry that it doesn't remove enough tissue to prevent the tumor from reoccurring. So surgeons have been really interested in whether we can remove just a sublobar resection for patients. And we have found that there may be a role for very small tumors that are at the edge of the lung um, that don't have any lymph node involvement. So really the peripheral tumors at the very earliest stages However, there's still a lot of caveats about that because we are still missing lymph nodes, so it's important to check those. Um, We would only do it with the very um, well-differentiated tumors with the lowest grade. So if patients end up um, on final pathology, if that um, result differs from the preoperative biopsy and patients have atypical carcinoid, then we would really recommend that they get the entire lobe removed, which could be another surgery. So for me, for In almost all of my cases, I would still recommend a lobectomy and an anatomic resection unless patients just are poor surgical candidates. There's also some question about whether it's possible to treat lung nets with a technique called bronchoscopic or endobronchial resection. In these surgeries, tumors are removed by means of a long, flexible device called an endoscope, which is usually lowered into the lungs through the throat. This is a much less invasive option, greatly reducing the post-surgical complications that can accompany a traditional surgery. The problem with these procedures, though, is they don't allow the surgeon to see as much of what's going on in the chest. And so, again, some fear that they may make it too difficult to make sure that all the malignant tissue is removed. So again, endobronchial resection may have a role for the entirely intraluminal tumors that don't involve the wall of the airway. However, this requires a highly trained interventional pulmonologist um, or surgeon, um, and it's a little hard to really determine sometimes at the beginning whether bronchoscopy is going to work. There's no lymph node assessment when they do the endobronchial resection, and it requires a lot of bronchoscopic surveillance, so not just the non-invasive CT scans, but an invasive um, procedure. So for now, again, endobronchial treatment is mostly reserved for patients who are poor surgical candidates, although it can be useful for patients who have a pneumonia because the tumor is blocking their airway. If one of these surgical treatments can be performed for your typical or atypical carcinoid, it's possible that no other treatment will be necessary. My name is Dave Bjork, and I live in Georgetown, Massachusetts, which is just north of Boston. I'm married and have three kids, and I was uh, diagnosed in um, 1998. I'm 58, so I was 37 years old at the time, non-smoker, very active. My kids were very young at the time. They were five, three, and one years old, my three boys. It came as quite a shock to me. I actually had pneumonia, and I put on antibiotics and you know, kind of went, went, went on my way. And then it was about six months later, I got sick again and went back in and and, and once again, I, I was diagnosed with pneumonia. And my doctor at the time, his response was, you know, you're, 
you you work a lot of hours, you have three young kids, you're exposed to a lot of stuff, yada, yada, you get run down. And, you know, my wife being a nurse, you know, she was like, that doesn't make sense because, you know, you shouldn't get pneumonia. But I was fortunate because the second time that I got pneumonia, the radiologist noticed that the infection was in the same spot. And so he uh, sent a note suggesting to my, my primary care doctor that I get a CAT scan to further investigate. And, and that's when they found out that I had a tumor in my lung. And that was what was <laughs> causing the infection because there was a blockage in my lobe. When I got the phone call from my doctor, that's what I, I often talk about, I often write about. And I, I remember that night because I was out. It was a going away party for a friend who was leaving the job. And we met at a restaurant and got the phone call. And I remember it was cold. I remember it was freezing cold. And he said, you know, Dave, you, you have you have a tumor. You have cancer and you need to come see me. And those words were like, oh, my God. I just like and, you know, um, that night was just it was just awful. And that's that's what people talk about. That's that emotional part of of when it all comes when it all becomes a reality. It's just like, holy moly, you know, you just got. I have cancer and that's that you hear that C word and um, never it changes your life forever and it really does and being the age that I was you know with my kids being so small that you know I knew that they probably weren't even going to be old enough to really grasp what was happening you know and, and the impact it was going to have on um, on our family it was it was it was terrible the surgery was was a success and in the surgery they actually also take uh, samples of your lymph nodes. And so I knew once I recovered, and it was in my room. The first time I saw my doctor, he told me that there was no spread of the cancer. They, they checked, there was clean margins and they, there was no spread into the lymph nodes. So I knew that it was a very good chance that, it, that they got it. They got all my cancer and that I wasn't going to um, have to have any further treatment. Uh, the only thing I had to do was go back um, in six months for a bronchoscopy, which is a test under full anesthesia again, where they go back in and with a scope to look at things and make sure everything's okay and there's no presence of cancer and whatnot. But there was no other treatment after that. And I've uh, had a great outcome, so I live a life of gratitude <laughs> ever since. Even though surgery can be curative in typical and sometimes even in atypical nets, when they're caught early enough, it's important to remember that even the slowest growing lung nets are malignant, and you have to keep monitoring for a while after the surgery to be sure they haven't returned or metastasized. The majority of times when these are picked up, these are picked up at an early stage. And in many cases, the patients will tell me that they were told that this is a benign tumor, don't worry about it, it just needs to come out, and you never have to think about it ever again. And clearly, we know that that is incorrect and that that this is indeed a cancer, a real cancer with the potential to metastasize both locally and also to distant sites. And where I see patients fall through the cracks is sometimes they'll go to the surgeon, they'll get their lung carcinoid removed and never have any follow-up anymore. And sometimes, you know, they come back six, seven, eight years later, and now they've got distant disease. Sometimes surgery isn't an option for low-grade lung nets because they metastasize beyond the local lymph nodes. So advanced disease is a thoracic neck patient or thoracic typical carcinoid patient that has already had metastatic disease at presentation. When we did the scan, let's suppose there are liver mets or bone mets. Those patients are unfortunately not curative. You cannot cure them. The goal shifts from cure to palliation to prolong their life and control the tumor as long as possible. And we do have few options. One of these options for extremely slow-moving disease is simply observation. Some of these cancers can spread so slowly that the growth is barely detectable. And in those cases, treatment might not be necessary until the spread begins to cause symptoms. This is often referred to as watchful waiting or watchful learning. When treatment does become necessary, the first line is often our old friends, somatostatin analogs, which as we've discussed in our other episodes, is a popular treatment with many kinds of nets. When we talk about lung neuronic tumor, 
by far majority of lung neuronicin tumors will express somatostatin receptors. If the patient is symptomatic, clearly we need to start therapy. And our upfront or frontline treatment of choice would be somatostatin analog. And both octreotide and lanreotide are used in common practice, which are long acting form of somatostatin analog once a month. And they work quite well. Somatostatin analogs can also be useful in the treatment of a very rare net related condition known as DIPNEC. It stands for diffuse idiopathic pulmonary neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia. So it's a mouthful, so which is why we call it DIPNEC. DIPNEC is a condition that causes the development of many small benign growths in the neuroendocrine cells in the lungs. These are not themselves cancerous, but seem to create a tendency for nets to develop down the line. DIPNEC can cause uncomfortable symptoms, though, which often resemble severe asthma. And recent research shows that these symptoms can be alleviated by taking somatostatin analogs. Uh, what we have learned and what uh, Aman and I described back in 2015 is a series of patients who had benefit with somatostatin analogs. And it's not so much that it, it, as far as we know, slow the progression of this, but helps out with the symptoms, primarily with cough. Something interesting is that both of these are what is known as off-label uses of somatostatin analogs meaning these medications have not been approved by the FDA for the treatment of either DIPNEC or typical lung carcinoids. Unfortunately, it's quite common with rare conditions that there just haven't been enough studies to secure official approval. So just because something's not FDA approved um, per se for a specific type of cancer, it doesn't mean that we can't use it. So, for instance, the somatostatin analogs, these are not FDA approved for neuroendocrine tumors of the lung, you know, but there is lots of data uh, to suggest benefits. There was a recent effort to gain FDA approval for the use of somatostatin analogs in lung nets, but unfortunately it was not completed because not enough patients enrolled in the clinical trial. And this was a worldwide study called the Spinet trial that accrued over a course of I believe, two to three years, but it was stopped, I believe, in 2018 because they're, they were a long way away from their accrual goal. And that data has yet to come out in publication. So, um, you know, what, what they did accrue and how those patients have done. Um, so, so we have to rely on some of the retrospective data. Nevertheless, there's enough retrospective and anecdotal evidence to make somatostatin analogs a preferred treatment choice for lung nets for many oncologists. When tumors progress further, there are other options. One of these is the only drug currently FDA approved for lung nets. The mTOR inhibitor Everlimus, which goes under the brand name Affinitor. Most people tolerate this medicine pretty well, but I tell people this is not gonna make their cancer go away unlikely to make it shrink, uh, but it's certainly, you know, the ho hope is that with this treatment that we will stop it from growing. And I've had patients on this treatment for, for a long duration, but at the same time, we always have to think about, all right, well, what, what else is next? What else do we have? Chemotherapy options like capecitabine and temozolomide or CAPTEM combination may be a second or third line option and many clinicians are very excited about the possibilities for nuclear medicine treatments such as PRRT. I'm really excited about the work currently being done by Dr. Tom Hope from UCSF. He's one of the thought leaders in nuclear medicine and neuronicin tumor field. And he's the, currently the national PI on this cooperative group study, which is funded by NCI and is available at various cancer centers throughout the US. This is one of the first studies which will be studying use of lutetium-177 dotatate prospectively in lung nets patients, which are positive for somatostatin receptors. I think this study is very pivotal in helping us advance treatment options for our lung net patients. The next two kinds of lung nets, atypical carcinoids and large cell neuroendocrine tumors, are very rare and less well understood and so their course of treatment is less well-defined. Atypical carcinoids are more aggressive than typical carcinoids, and they metastasize faster and more frequently, 
but there is a wide variety within that designation. Exactly how aggressive they are is measured by something called the mitotic index, which describes how quickly cancer cells multiply. Atypical carcinoids with a lower score on the mitotic index are treated in a very similar way as typical carcinoids. If they have not metastasized, surgery is an option. And if they have, familiar net treatments like somatostan analogs, mTOR inhibitors, and PRRT might be used. Treatment for more fast-growing atypical carcinoids is more likely to involve options like radiation and chemotherapy. Where this really gets difficult is that it is not uncommon for the same patient to have both low and high-grade atypical carcinoids in their body at the same time. These are a little tricky cancers. Unlike low-grade or typical carcinoids, atypical carcinoids can be very heterogeneous. Not all the cancer cells, even in the same patients, are similar. Sometimes you see different clones of cells with different biology, different grade. There could be some neuroendocrine cancers uh, or tumor cells which are low grade, and there could be other areas uh, with higher grade tumor. There could be some areas with low somatostatin receptor expression, and there could be others with high somatostatin receptor expression. We always have to uh, evaluate about heterogeneity of the tumor uh, behavior and treat the more aggressive subset first and get that under control before we worry about the more indolent, more slow-growing clone of tumor. This tendency to have a wide range of different kinds of tumors at the same time means that patients with atypical carcinoids often have to go through slightly different imaging than people with other kinds of nets to make sure all these differences are understood. In addition to the lutetium dotatate PET scans, which look for somatostatin receptors and are very commonly performed for net patients, but very uncommon for patients with other types of cancers, people with atypical lung carcinoids will often also be asked to take FTG PET CT scans, which are very commonly performed for other kinds of cancers, but only rarely for nets. In FTG PET imaging, we inject a dye, which is a radio-labeled glucose, as we know, all living cells need sugar or glucose to survive. Cancer cells need even more of that because they are dividing very rapidly. So the cancer cells from an aggressive tumor, they take up all that radio-labeled glucose and our PET imager is able to locate where exactly is that radio-labeled glucose going in the body. And that's how we are able to figure out if a tumor is more active, more hypermetabolic, more aggressive, as compared to our conventional low-grade net patients. Then we come to large cell nets, the second most aggressive form of lung nets. Surgery is sometimes an option with large cell nets, though less often than with some other kinds we've discussed. And when it is done, it usually has to be followed immediately with other treatments to prevent the spread of the disease. In this particular case, if the surgery is done and resection is done in large cell neuronicin cancer, adjuvant treatment is recommended, either giving chemotherapy or radiation after the surgery, because the chances of micrometastatic disease left behind is very high. These are very aggressive cancers, and even if they have gotten the tumor out, there is a chance that there could be microscopic disease. After surgery or when surgery is not an option, these tumors tend to receive treatments such as radiation and chemotherapy, very similar to what we'll hear about for small cell lung cancer. Interestingly though, some current research is showing that a subset of large cell nets seem to have an internal biology that is closer to forms of non-neuroendocrine lung cancer than other kinds of nets. Recently, there was this really interesting study from Memorial Sloan Kettering and what they found when you do next generation sequencing on these large cell neuronicin carcinoma patients, a subset of them, about 40% of them shows genetic signatures, which are similar to small cell lung cancer. And about 60% of them show genetic signatures of non-small cell lung cancer, like an adenocarcinoma. So we are now learning that this large cell neuronicin cancer could be molecularly very heterogeneous. This is an area of active research we are still learning more and more about it. 
But for practical purposes, most patients get treated just akin to small cell lung cancer with platinum-based chemotherapy. But I'm not surprised a lot of doctors out in community also employ non-small cell lung cancer regimens to treat pulmonary large cell neuronicin cancer. At the other end of the spectrum, we have small cell lung cancer, which is extremely aggressive and extremely difficult to treat. So if it's a limited stage small cell lung cancer, that being it's still in lung or thoracic cavity, it's still not spread. Even within the thoracic cavity, it's not in multiple spots, just one area and can be covered by one field of radiation. And these patients are treated with combination of chemotherapy and choice of chemotherapy is a platinum doublet. Can be a cis platinidopocide or carboplatinidopocide, followed with concurrent radiation. So... The patient also gets radiation, external beam radiation, to the chest while getting the chemotherapy. That is standard treatment. Even if this treatment works well, it only brings five-year survival from 5% up to 10% of total patients. On the grim end of the spectrum, the patient has extensive stage small cell lung cancer at time of diagnosis, which unfortunately most of the patients do because this is a cancer which is very aggressive. Sometimes the duplication rate of or doubling time is almost as high as 14 days. So the tumor can actually double in size in just two weeks. This is how aggressive this cancer is. So it's not uncommon for us to see patients with extensive metastases at time of diagnosis. And these patients can have meds in brain at time of presentation, adrenal glands, liver, bone, lymph nodes, So the treatment for extensive stage small cell lung cancer is palliative chemotherapy. We start off with platinum-based chemotherapy, carboplatinidopocide or cisplatinidopocide. And most recently, the big advancement which we have been made in this field is addition of immunotherapy. So immunotherapy now is a standard of care, FDA approved. And we often use atezolizumab, which is the first FDA-approved immunotherapy agent in the frontline setting for small cell lung cancer. Now, despite our aggressive chemotherapy and immunotherapy, unfortunately, most of the patients would eventually progress as we go further down the therapy. Third line, fourth line, the response rates in small cell lung cancer unfortunately dips to 10%, 15%. So chemotherapies often don't work. Cancer becomes much more resistant And patients, of course, have a rapid decline in performance status, cannot tolerate more chemotherapy. So overall survival in metastatic small cell lung cancer is unfortunately one to one and a half years even today. So this is an area of unmet need, and it's called a recalcitrant cancer because we haven't really made a major advancement in small cell lung cancer in the last 30 years. There is, however, new research into a form of immunotherapy that may open up new treatment options for this dangerous kind of cancer. In last several years, we have really expanded our understanding of the underlying mechanism, the molecular biology, and genetics of the cancers, including neuroendocrine cancers. Recently, what we have uncovered that a particular pathway called notch pathway is heavily expressed in high-grade neuroendocrine cancers. One of the receptors for this notch pathway is called DLL3. This seems to be heavily expressed in all varieties of high-grade neuroendocrine cancers. One of the reasons why certain tumor types grows uncontrollably is because our immune system is not able to recognize these cancers, which is foreign to the the host. And since the immune system cannot recognize them, they continue to grow uncontrolled. However, with the help of bispecific T-cell engager or bites, we are making our immune system come closer to the tumor cells and really inducing that immune damage to the cancer, or at least that's the hypothesis. So one end of this and the body attaches to the T cells, which are the immune cells of the body. And the other end of the antibody attaches to the tumor cells via a targeting antibody like DLL3 antibody in this particular case. 
So it's really catching all the immune cells and bringing them closer to the tumor and making them uh, inflame the tumor, kill the tumor in that sense. This gives us a very unique opportunity to target high-grade neuroendocrine cancers like small cell lung cancers, which are truly an unmet critical need. Um, Terlatumab is one of the first in this class drug, and the phase one data looks quite promising. Now, there are several other investigational products which are targeting DLL3 with help of either BITE or TRITAC, and similar immunotherapies. And we are eagerly awaiting uh, more clinical data from phase one and phase two studies. Something that all four kinds of lung nuts share is the tendency to metastasize into places that are less common for many other kinds of nets. While they can spread to the liver the way small bowel and pancreatic nets tend to do, they can also often metastasize to the bones. So bone metastases can happen anywhere. Uh, yeah, I mean, frequently I see them in the spine, I see them in the ribs, uh, we see them in the skull bones, um, in the long bones as well. So really, really anywhere. They can present with pain or they can present with fracture. And sometimes these things are just seen on imaging and they can be asymptomatic. You know, the, the thing we get concerned about the most is when these cancers metastasize to the spine because at that point these things can impinge on the spinal cord if this pushes too far this can lead to paralysis so that becomes uh one of the one of the few oncologic emergencies with uh with that being spinal cord compression so when they cause pain if it's a localized area of of pain, sometimes we can use a short course of targeted radiation to help alleviate that pain. Mm -hmm. There's some groups that can sometimes go in with a, with their interventional radiologist and ablate that site, uh, uh, but it's more common to use uh, radiation for that. The other uh, agents that we use to help treat bone metastasis are those that help prevent that bone from breaking. So there's a couple different medicines, uh, zoledronic acid and also a medicine called denosumab, which, which are both useful uh, to try to help prevent these types of events. The aggressive small cell and large cell neuroendocrine lung tumors can also metastasize to the brain. With the, with the higher grade cancers, we look for this. We, we know that there's a high risk of, of this disease going to the brain. So right at the initial diagnosis, we always get an MRI of the brain to look for this. In the lower grade tumors, it, it's uncommon. So we don't look for it unless there's symptoms. So symptoms including headache, visual changes, if there's, if there's any uh, focal weakness, certainly if there's been a seizure. Um, I, I had a patient uh, just about a month ago who, who developed symptoms of having a stroke and uh, we sent her for an MRI and I was expecting her to have a stroke just based on the symptoms, but it turned out it was a brain metastasis. So when someone has brain metastasis, in many cases, the initial problem is swelling of the area around that particular brain met. You know, it's an irritant to that, that tissue. So we initially start some steroids to help bring that swelling down. If the patient has had a seizure associated with this, we'll put them on anti-seizure medication. Now, the treatment of it really depends on where it is and how big it is and if there's more than one. If there's one or sometimes more than one that are in uh, desirable locations where they can be taken out, uh, we send these patients to the neurosurgeon and who takes them out. The other option for treatment with this is targeted radiation where, where we can actually give this patient very focused radiation that kills off that spot in the brain. Because lung nets are a small subset of what is already a relatively uncommon cancer, the other thing all four kinds have in common is that there is still a lot to learn about them and how they behave. But research is being done. Just a few weeks before this podcast was released, in the first week of June of 2023, Dr. Shohan attended a conference called ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, 
where results from several promising early-stage research studies were presented. ASCO 2023 was probably the largest gathering of oncologists throughout the world. And we did see that there were some notable advancements in thoracic oncology field, especially neuroendocrine cancers, uh, and in particular, high-grade neuroendocrine cancers like small cell lung cancers. There were some key phase one and early phase uh, lab studies, which do uh, throw some light on what's going to come in the near future and looks very, very promising. One of those targets is DLL3. Another interesting study is looking at a biomarker called GD2, which is heavily expressed in high-grade neuroendocrine cancers like small cell lung cancers. Another promising target, which looked very exciting and builds on a very interesting science, is SEZ6. It's an AbV compound, and the investigator presented the phase one data with very promising safety profile as well as early efficacy data. So these are some of the novel compounds in development which might be transformative for our high-grade neuroendocrine cancer patients. Besides that, some late phase studies were also reported, especially the randomized phase two study by Dr. Kareem looking into PARP inhibition and immune checkpoint inhibitor as a frontline maintenance in extensive stage small cell lung cancer. And there seems to be some benefit of the combination PARP inhibition and immune checkpoint inhibitor in bioselected patients who have Schleffen 11 mutation. So the whole field is definitely um, moving towards biomarker-driven studies which is excellent for our patients because we want to move away from a one-size-fit-all approach. We have to tailor treatment towards the individual tumor genetics and an individual patient needs. So overall, uh, very, very promising early phase studies reported at ASCO 2023. I think future is bright for high-grade neuroendocrine cancer, thoracic subset. It's only through the participation of motivated lung net patients that this research continues and our understanding of these nets continue to grow. So please, if you or someone you know is currently living with a lung net, find a doctor who specializes in lung nets. Seek out research studies and clinical trials that are enrolling patients like you and be a vocal part of the larger net community. Together, we will continue to improve our understanding of lung nets and support the development of improved treatments. Thanks for listening to NetWise. I'm Jessica Thomas, Director of Patient Education for the Net Research Foundation. Our production partner for this series is Citizen Racecar. This episode was produced by David Hoffman, who did the original post-production and co-wrote the original episode with Laren Hyder. Post-production of this revision by Jose Miguel Baez. Production manager, Gabriela Montequin. It was made possible by the generous support of Ibsen, Tercera Therapeutics, and Novartis. If you would like to join NetRF in our mission to fund research for net cancer or help support educational programs like this NetWise podcast, please go to netrf.org slash donate This is a production of the Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation. We're committed to improving the lives of patients, families, and caregivers affected by neuroendocrine cancer by funding research to discover cures and more effective treatments and providing information and educational resources. Please visit us at netrf.org. This podcast is not intended as and shall not be relied upon as medical advice. The Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation encourages all listeners to discuss any scientific information found here with their personal oncologist, physician, and or appropriate qualified health professional. Listening to this podcast does not constitute a patient-physician relationship. The Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation does not represent that any information provided here should supplant the reasoned, informed advice of a patient's personal oncologist, physician, or appropriate qualified health professional. 